techniques. There are a lot of them in Fantasy Star Online. Some are better than others. Let's rank them according to their usefulness in speedruns. The highest techs will stand out the most and save the most time. Other factors include risk, cost, accessibility, and my personal preference. S tier includes the best picks, A tier are a step down, and so on down to F tier which has no use at all. This covers the GameCube and Xbox version only because techniques and forces in the Dreamcast version are very different. I'll cover Episode 1 Glitchless, Episode 2 Glitchless, and all missions categories. We'll start with the technique the game gives for free to all level 1 forces, Voy. This is a good baseline as it is a literal foundation for all glitchless speedruns. It's nothing fancy or flashy. It is a simple projectile fireball that hits one target and doesn't require targeting ahead of time. As the starter spell, there are naturally far better options, but it's still a fairly solid technique that gets frequent use. I'll put this in C tier. Fire is a good element, roughly half the enemy types in either episode are weak to it, or weak enough, and those types are also the most common by far. Early on, it two or three shots most mobs, but falls behind by runes even if uprated. Only the mine area has few things weak to fire, and Foy being a single target attack makes it fall off even further later on in the game. Still, it's useful on Sinnohs, Bringers, and clean up of any scraps. Even on Hunters, it's a good option to mix in due to no RNG misses compared to very spotty gun accuracy, plus it's good on Day Relay. In Episode 2, its quickness makes it a safe option when avoiding death is something requiring even more intention than typical. Overall, it is an important technique that covers about half of the game, but the easier half. For another baseline, let's jump to the bottom of the tier list to throw out a fairly obvious ranking. Reverser, the revival technique, is naturally not useful to speedruns, so it goes to F tier. In single player mode, there's nothing to revive. Co-op speedruns are cool, but I'm not counting those here. Even if I did, it's slower than the moon animizer, which is obtainable much sooner than reverser is available and learnable, and buying it costs the same as 10 moons. Additionally, it doesn't save NPCs when playing escort missions. If your alley hits 0 HP, you immediately fail. At least the disc is worth a fair amount to sell. Let's cover the other simple techniques. B is for Barda, a tier unto itself. Barda has the strange distinction of being the weakest technique, but yet one of the most useful due to its ability to hit multiple things while being very TP and expensive. It operates very similarly to Foy, but the icy line attack continues forward even if it touches something. Barda is the butter to the bread of Foy. These two techniques alone can carry forces through the first half of episode 1. Although fewer things are weak to ice, its low TP cost makes it a good option to round out kills on things weak to something else. Area of effect combined with availability keeps this spell relevant throughout episode 1. Even though enemy density is low in forest and caves, there are several opportunities to pair things up. Barda is the only reasonable option to fight the dragon as a force as it heavily resists Foy and Zond, and TP is very tight. Ice also covers the second Dark Falls phase, and better options frequently are missing. Dell Sabers get easily stunlocked by Barda, and Hunters can make good use of this too, since Barda can't be blocked. Still, the lack of raw power holds it back from true greatness. It's uniquely in between the heavy area hitters and the limited single target damage dealers. Moving over to the Thunder element, Zond. As a single target spell, it definitely isn't more useful than Foy, and probably sees less use overall, so it goes to C tier. Not many enemy types are weak to this element, though almost everything in mines is susceptible. For other areas, the things Zond is useful on tend to be high HP and high movement targets, where the next best option is not only slower, but a lot more obnoxious due to miss potential. Zond sits in between Foy and Barda in power, and does not miss as it strikes instantly, but it costs the most TP of the three. The unique property of being able to lock on to targets from any angle, even from behind the caster, eases control when kiting, or just needing to quickly find the next target. The potential for shocking machines is nice, but too rare to be relied upon, and sometimes it works against the player. Although it is strongish in mines, Zond is not ideal at all due to the large enemy density. The game expects area of effect attacks to be carried at this point. I want to cover one of the more well-known spells sooner rather than later. In casual play, this is easily the most commonly used technique, and one everyone wants, and practically everyone needs. Of course, I'm talking about Resta. In the speedrun setting, Resta isn't so hot. It is solidly a D-tier technique. It really comes down to it being slow to get hit in the first place. Sometimes it happens, and when it does, recovery items like Monomates are faster and as effective. Resta takes a significant chunk of TP to do the same thing, so there's not many places where it is the optimal play. It's nice insurance in case healing items are depleted. 
It can be invaluable in averting quest failure from your NPC tag-along being too distracted to heal themselves, but this requires level 3. When income is tight and hits are harder to avoid, such as in episode 2, Resta shines a bit more because one mana fluid for a 100 Meseta yields 5 Resta, compared to only 2 mana mates costing the same. Ultimately, time spent using Resta is always time that could have been spent progressing forward instead. Before I forget, and I totally almost forgot it when writing this list, Anti! Needing to use this technique means you somehow got poisoned and ran out of antidotes, which the game drops commonly. Poison can only reduce HP to 1, making it usually more of a nuisance than a problem. At level 2, its usefulness increases for handling NPC ally quests, because it can cure any paralysis they receive. It's a bit harder to avoid NPCs taking hits while still going fast, and characters like Ash or Donuff contribute quite significantly to damage output. Still, it's a mitigation of something bad happening, not ideal to use. It can join Resta in D tier. I've been hitting a lot of middling entries, Let's finally talk about a top tier technique. Rabarda, S tier. This thing packs a punch and is way better than the other ice options overall. Barda can't compare in damage per second until 6th level, and Gibarda takes even longer. A couple of downsides, it burns through TP fairly quickly, and its range is limited. On the other hand, it has a fairly low barrier to entry, requiring the least MST of any of the advanced attack techniques. Its requirement is so low that finding a level 3 disc in ruins is still good, while the same could not be said for the other raw techs. Even Humar and Huneral has a chance to get this in their arsenal during a run. There's also the Freeze Chance, which, while unreliable, can really help trivialize a wave. To fight with Rabarda, you must get close to your foes. If you're not confident in the spacing and timing, you'll waste a lot of TP and possibly get slapped. Although Rabarda is mostly only available in and useful in Ruins, there are plenty of waves uniquely suited to it. Barda and Gibarda's forward-only attacks are somewhat limiting, it's also strong enough to attack Volop's core directly in Phase 1, and for all missions run, it can one-shot Evil Sharks with enough bonus MST. It's almost always the best option for Dark Falls Phase 2, except maybe for Form the Worlds. In Episode 2, it has fewer applications, it's not much as weak to it in Seabed, but it's still very useful on Ogaflow. Depending on your perspective and preference, you could easily argue this is the best overall technique. It definitely is not my top 3. Something not in my top 3? Gibarna. The last of the Ice Techs is just D tier. This technique was somewhat decent on the Dreamcast, but was nerfed possibly more than any other since then. Kibara suffers from slowness, awkwardness, limited area of effect, and insufficient damage to offset these other weaknesses. Yes, it is stronger than Barda, anything is, but its damage per second is not a ton higher for the cost, and its spray isn't much better than Barda's line. Due to how auto-targeting works, the cone is often wasted as the target shifts to something to the side. Gibarda level 1 awkwardly does less damage than 2 Barda level 2, and awkwardly leaves La Dominions and Del Sabers at low HP in early ruins. Gibarda level 2 cleans this up. The slow cone has some niches, like striking back at Dark Falls to Rafoy. This is all considering Gibarda gets the 30% damage boost on Phonum. Phonum roll with level 3 boosted Barda does more damage outright. Ultimately, it is rarely the technique you'd want, even when it's at its best. Gifoy, on the other hand, is very solid. This will be the first A-tier entry. It's clearly slower and less powerful than Rabarda, while having a similar effect. The long delay after casting makes it unwieldy to use without risking getting hit. On the other hand, the effect duration length is second to none, which gives it some flexibility. The power is generally good enough. In all missions, it shines as an early drop due to the high amount of time spent in the caves. It's one of two options for a fast day relay kill, but it doesn't have a ton of follow-up for mines. In Ruins, plenty of things weak to fire moving quickly give it plenty of opportunities. In Episode 2, it's good in any area, especially with things like wolves and gibbons, but a bit sketchier in Seabed due to it being very dangerous to get near anything. Its availability is very good, as it can drop as early as Dragon Loot, and it shows up in the shop more commonly than the raw techs. The low MST requirement lets Phonum easily have it, and even Humar can get it eventually with some fortunate units. Honestly, this technique is borderline S-tier. It's a shame that... Rafoy exists. If Gifoy borders S-rank, then Rafoy is easily there. It's going straight to the top. It's basically a strict upgrade to Gifoy. Where Gifoy is slow, Rafoy is fast. While Gifoy requires getting somewhat close, Rafoy lets you stay back. Gifoy's damage is good, but Rafoy's is even better. Its TP cost is higher, but it's more than justified. With so many things weak to fire, this gives the player an absolute win button. 
Other raw techniques require getting near or in between your targets, making them way harder to use effectively. In every category, this becomes run transforming because of being able to easily position and waste no time. The only downsides? The damage comes out after a brief delay, and its effect is over in a flash. It's a bit unwieldy when things get too close, so sometimes it's not the best option. When surrounded by foes closing in, Gifoy can work better. A lock-on is required for the spell to do anything, so it can't be manually aimed, and won't work buffered when getting up off the ground. However, this attribute is usually beneficial, allowing it to easily hit things that like to jump around, like Gibbons or Okaflow 1. Overall, it's so much better than the next best option, and of the raw techniques, it's by far the easiest to use effectively. What a great technique. Not every technique can measure up as great, or even okay. Ryuker certainly is one of those. The disc costs 5,000 Meseda to buy, a hefty sum. You could buy 14 telepipes instead, which is usually more than any speedrun in any category will need. Even if received as a drop, which is rare and only available in the last levels, its MST requirement is high, and it's much slower than the instant effect of the consumable item. In extremely rare and theoretical circumstances, it could save time when shop refreshing to get a critical item like Digger HP to appear. In practice, this never happens. That said, if it does drop for someone that can use it, it can save money. Depending on the category, route, and drop luck, money can be tight, so Ryukur can shine, theoretically. So that belongs in E rank. Shifta similarly struggles to be relevant, which is a shame due to its prominence in high level casual play. At low levels, its ATP multiplier is low, and the ATP it's multiplying is also low. Shifta only multiplies base ATP and the variance in weapon ATP. Only Huneral, Ramar, and Ramarl can practically make use of Shifta, and their weapon use is not great to begin with. Mathing out Shifta with a brand, the buff will add at most 6 damage on a heavy attack in ideal circumstances, and that's at the very end of a run. This isn't exactly terrible, but the buff only lasts 40 seconds. Optimistically, assuming all 40 of those seconds go into full heavy attack combos that never miss, this will yield about 60 extra damage. Counting misses and bosses moving away, this full bonus will never be realized. You might as well use attack techniques instead to make better use of your TP and time. In some theoretical circumstances, when a boss is untargetable, casting Shifta might be better than nothing, but this is dubious. At level 3, it never will make a difference to NPCs, as even the strongest ones are still too passive. I'll put this at the bottom of E tier, because even Ryuku seems more likely to make a difference. Similar to Shifta, the DFP buff technique D-Band is fairly pointless at low level. The same problems apply, with a small multiplier on top of an even smaller base stat number. DFP is all but irrelevant for most casters, as with D-Band or without, getting hit will topple any force, and anything but full HP is too low generally. D-Band at low levels may add only 2 DFP, which reduces physical damage by less than 0.5 on average. However, it's potentially more useful than Shifta, so we'll sit above it in E tier. Derelay's ceiling rock debris attack is physical based, and thus mitigated by DFB. It also happens to deal roughly 60 damage, right around Phonoom's HP at level 7. D band might make the difference between life and death, and there's plenty of downtime to cast it. Of course, this assumes you're missing key techniques like Gifoy. I don't think it's actually come up in a real run. Enough with the bottom tier for now. Here's one that's fun, Gazand. This normal technique is unquestionably S tier. This technique is absolutely essential for speeding through the middle areas of the game. It has good power while also having the speed of a simple technique and an instant hit connection. It's flexible like chain lightning, but also will hit everything in a wide cone in front regardless. It has a lot of unique properties, such as being able to hit multiple hitboxes of the same foe for extra damage. This lets it work well even when its element is resisted. 75% of the bosses in the game are fought optimally with Gazand. Volopt Phase 2 isn't worth fighting without it. I think it's reasonable to put Gazand at any position in S tier depending on how you value different things. I'm setting it lower because, as impressive as its uses are, I believe Rafoy and Rabarda stand out just a bit more, while Gazand doesn't contribute as much in the final stages, where fewer things are weak to it and alternatives are more available. As Gizan's power stops clearing things quickly, Razand steps up to cover its element against bulky late game foes. The availability isn't great, and Gazan can fill in better for it than vice versa. This lands Razand in A tier. 
Only Phonium can really utilize Razan to its full potential with its unique 30% damage boost, but it does get several advantages. Guild Chicks and Dupe Chicks get one shot. Lots of time is saved in Vol Opt 1 by attacking the core directly, and Falls 1 becomes risk free even with low HP. Dark Belras can be 3 shot with enough extra MST. Razan's raw power is unmatched by any tech that can be bought, but it's not nearly as flexible as Gizand, reaching shorter and casting slower. It is still king when Razan damage is desired, but these opportunities are relatively niche. Speaking of niche, Jelen. You might think, like D-Band, damage mitigation isn't that useful. You would be correct, but Jelen has enough merit to earn a spot in D tier. The multipliers of the debuffs work the same way as the buffs, with Jelen level 1 subtracting 10% ATP. Most of the time, there's no point in using this, but there are a few physical attacks so powerful that casting Jelen might make the difference between life and death. Compared to D-Band, the effect is a lot more pronounced and proven, reducing De Relay's rock damage by about 6, and Dalebiter's slap by about 15. Jelen brings some very dangerous things out of the lethal range. Obviously, it's not ideal to spend resources on Jelen, but preventing a death is a good investment. On the opposite side, Zalur doesn't help a ton either, and isn't relevant to forces at all. It has a lot of the same problems as Shifta. Why cast it when you could use attack techs anyway? Still, the math works well because Zalur fully cuts a foe's DFP value compared to Shifta's partial ATP multiplier. A Humar probably is the most likely to be getting better damage from weapons than attack techs. A small micro-optimization would be to cast Zalur when a boss is out of range or moving away, then follow up later. With De Relay, damage from heavy attacks can be boosted by about 3, and the sword hitting the mask 3 times lets this become a significant augment. Dark Falls is tanky enough to consider using it if there's an opportunity. Theoretically, if someone were to actually bring a Humar to Episode 2, Zillur would add 8-9 to nine damage to strong attacks against Ogaflow Phase 2, with plenty of chances to use it. This is really scraping the bottom of the niche barrel, but it can ride the coattails of D tier. We're almost done. Almost all of the attack techs get their power from hitting multiple targets. The exceptions are early simple techs, but there is one heavy hitter that focuses on single target damage. Grants. This is an amazing tech, and it can go to A tier. Finding it and being able to use it is a blessing to any run. Its damage potential is huge, doing basically double the damage as Razand, the next most heavy hitting tech, though it is a bit slower and its damage hits very delayed. Its mechanics are otherwise very similar to Zond, for better and worse, auto-locking onto enemies behind your character, but never missing as long as the lock is held. Unfortunately, Grants won't drop until Ruins, and many enemies resist its light element. It requires a lot of luck just to find a Grants disc, and being able to use it immediately also requires some extra luck for MST boosts. It's not fast enough to warrant using on many waves because area damage would be preferred for speed or TP efficiency. Still, it's great for both phases of Dark Falls, with either phase benefiting from the long range, and its delayed damage doesn't get negated by falls becoming untargetable. Small numbers of Bulklaw, Dark Gunner, and Dark Bellra can be cleaned up quickly of grants, but these situations are few and far between. Light Element is a possibility for Oka Flow Phase 2's weakness cycle, completely stalling the player for over a minute each time they don't have grants. It shines as an awesome single target tech, but unfortunately grants can't be at the top in a game so reliant on mostly target damage, so there are better options. But Magid isn't one of them. Although it's billed as a one-shot wonder, it is way slower than other projectiles, but it's also slow to cast, and costs a lot of TP. Not only is it mechanically slow, but its effect is all but nil. Almost everything in the game has enough dark resistance to completely negate Magid level 1. Even against zero EDK, it will only work about one-fourth of the time. Dim weapons available early in the game work much more reliably for less cost. Basically, it's as useless as Reverser, but at least Reverser doesn't pretend like it's useful, and Reverser's disc is more valuable to sell. Take your seat at the bottom, Magid. That's all for the PSO speedrunning technique tier list. Later.